Microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the 31st week of 2011. For more than 20 years, this program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on local radio station WEFT, and when I was censored and excluded there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good people at Urbana Public Television. Which does in fact seem to be, quote, an accessible, responsible, and responsive media outlet, which WEFT by its charter is supposed to be, and I'm sorry to say, is not. I'm Carl Esterbrook. My discussants tonight are David Green and Ron Zope. Our format will be to take turns introducing a topic or a comment or an outrage from the week's news, which the others will comment on or ask questions about, and we'll try to go around several times. The program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky, who's been talking since about American politics for twice as long as we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, quote, Either you repeat the same conventional things everyone is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. Well, we'll try to say some true things tonight. It's Friday, August 5th, 2011, and on this date in 1861, in order to help pay for the war effort, the United States government levied the first income tax as part of the Revenue Act of 1861. 3% of all incomes over $800 at the time. Uh, it was rescinded in 1872 uh, and uh, reappeared only in connection with the First World War. Uh, so the connection between uh, taxes and war uh, couldn't be more obvious. Uh, we want to talk about some ways in which they're bound up today uh, and the uh, result of the, uh, as a result of the debt, debt deficit crisis uh, and I hope you hear the inverted commas around that, uh, that we've been going through in these last couple of weeks. Also on this day, of course, in 1945, the U.S. was preparing for an attack on Hiroshima with an atomic bomb. The atomic bomb, the little boy, was dropped, on the, on, uh, dropped by the United States B-29 in Nola Gay. Uh, the, uh, the plane was named for the pilot's mother. Uh, about 70,000 people uh, were killed by the bomb instantly and some tens of thousands in the years afterwards from burns and radiation poisoning. Uh, another connection of the income tax and war undoubtedly. Uh, there are other uh, examples today from the history of American warfare. Uh, August 5th seems to have been a particularly productive day uh, in this unfortunate era, area. Uh, for example, uh, American aircrafts from uh, uh, aircraft carriers in the uh, off Vietnam attacked North Vietnam. Uh, on this day for the first time uh, in retaliation for events in the Tonkin Gulf, uh, events themselves that uh, were even at the time understood to be uh, highly doubtful. Uh, it's important to remember, of course, that the, the war the U.S. conducted in Southeast Asia was a war against South Vietnam, our ostensible ally. And uh, there are parallels, of course, with what we're doing right now in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, and they should be borne in mind. Uh, as Noam Chomsky he says, uh, that's the reason people don't study history, it just teaches you too much. You're watching News from Neptune, the Make Me Do It edition. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that when my turn comes around. But we'll start with Ronzo. Yeah. I want to ask today, uh, my colleagues here, are you serious? <laughs> Uh, There's a guy by that name who kicked <laughs> around for a while. Seriously, yeah, the first two Mr. Initials, Sirius, right? uh, Representative Paul Ryan of Wisconsin and his supposed budget, but uh, that may not be who you had in mind. <laughs> this is provoked by an article in Al Jazeera that uh, you will not, I think, see in the American media by Ted Rawl, the oh, cartoonist, yes. who says the U.S. media, or his headline writer says, 
derides views outside the mainstream as unserious, and our democracy suffers as a result. He quotes here several uh, pronouncements about uh, who's serious and who's not. Um, columnist David Brooks <laughs> opined recently in the New York Times that public disgust about the debt ceiling crisis has risen to epic levels, yet through all this, serious people, Barack Obama, John Boehner, and members of the Gang of Six have soldiered on. Another quotation from uh, Peter Coy of Business Week magazine. Uh, there's a comforting story about the debt ceiling that goes back, uh, that goes like this back in the 1990s. The U.S. was shrinking its national debt at a rapid place. Serious people actually worried about dislocations from having too little government debt. Fox News, the Murdoch-owned house organ of America's official right wing, asserted no one seriously thinks that the U.S. will not honor its obligations, whatever happens with the current impasse on President Obama's requested increase in the government's 14.3 trillion borrowing limit, and so on. So this reminded me of uh, one of uh, Carl's frequent points about uh, um, setting the limits uh, of debate, and this is uh, uh, the term that uh, Rawl uses as well. The American media deploy deploys a deep and varied arsenal of rhetorical devices in order to mag marginalize opinions, people, and organizations as outside the mainstream. Uh, so we've heard this uh, again and again for uh, political opponents, uh, that they are outside the mainstream of American life. Um, the rhetoric of being uh, unserious or uh, uh, disingenuous or irresponsible, it varies uh, somewhat, always seems to f uh, f fall on uh, leftists. This writer points out that uh, when a personality almost always on the left becomes too big to ignore, the mainstream media often res resorts to ridicule. Like Communist Party Chief Gus Hall, Nader is often referred to, Ralph Nader, as the per perennial presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. Personalities on the far right wing, like Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman, on the other hand, are characterized as refreshing and exciting, <laughs> if intellectually slight. <coughs> Acknowledgement when it happens is uh, post-mortem. Revisionist historian Howard Zinn and muckraking DC journalist I.F. Stone received lengthy accolades and obituaries that appeared, appeared in the New York Times, which studiously censored them throughout their careers, and so on. So uh, Rawls says, in this topsy, wacky topsy-turvy world where the people who are usually wrong get to lord it over those who are usually get it right, object failures like Obama and Boehner who make logical assertions that are uh, nothing but, that is, wacky, and who have presided over fix fiscal collapse while not making the slightest effort to stimulate the economy with public works and other classic Keynesian responses are lauded as serious people. Mm -hmm. So uh, who counts as serious and who does not? In the presidential uh, debates, uh, there are twice third party candidates have uh, been allowed on the stage. Uh, one of them in uh, 1980, I guess it was. Uh, and uh, the last one was... Uh, uh, Ross Perot. Ross Perot in 92, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's no record of any leftist ever been, <laughs> ever uh, being uh, considered because uh, they're, not, they're not serious. Okay, um, serious themes. American incomes plummet by 15% in 2009. This writer, Liz Goodwin, um, says that the uh, new tax data obtained by uh, Reuters shows that average American incomes plummeted by more than 15% in 2009 compared to 2007 incomes. The average income was $54,283. Again, we're not told whether that's the mean or the median, the median being much more meaningful, of course. The uh, mean, the yeah. arithmetic average, being often very distorted by a few extremely high incomes. If uh, 
um, the uh, very rich are included in there. Uh, just a few of them can really change the average. 4.2 million taxpayers reported earning any income at all in uh, that year, that is uh, 2009. More than 40% of all tax returns were from individuals or families who earned so little they did not have to pay income tax. The average wages of those who filed but did not pay income taxes was $14,483, but 1,470 of the 235,000 413 taxpayers who earned more than a million dollars also paid no income taxes in 2009, according to Reuters. So, news from uh, the Associated Press, Jennifer Kerr writes, baby boomers worry about finances and health costs. This is getting, the message is getting through to more and more middle class people who, on the whole, I find, uh, are on uh, are still uh, very complacent, unaware of this, and really afraid to uh, address the issue. So uh, uh, the uh, possibility of enormous catastrophic medical expenses is very much on their minds. Meanwhile, the uh, Census Bureau reports uh, this: the headline re recession drives races further apart. Monetarily, the average white person has 20 times the net worth of the average black person. Yeah. In Yahoo News uh, from the Associated Press, healthy eating is a privilege of the rich. We keep wondering about why we have the obesity epidemic. The usual explanation is that uh, poorer people have worse diets because they're eating uh, calorie uh, filled things uh, with a lot of uh, fat, sugar, and salt in them. And it's done because uh, they like the taste of it better. But uh, uh, try eating uh, healthily, uh, uh, whatever you think that means, organic, natural, whatever. And you'll find it costs significantly more. And the question is, can they afford to uh, eat healthy and uh, probably lengthen their life in that way? So, uh, one more point on... Uh, Seriousness? Uh, yeah, domestic uh, uh, situations. Uh, in Time Magazine, curiously, one Brian Walsh writes that uh, the GOP's hidden debt deal agenda to gut the EPA. Each of these bills that are, is being proposed by the Republicans and the Tea Party component within the Republicans uh, seems to have a lot of writers and about uh, limiting the Environmental Protection uh, Agency and uh, doing away with their regulatory uh, apparatus that uh, is trying to prevent uh, environmental uh, destruction. So it's become orthodoxy uh, among the uh, Republicans that you claim that uh, warnings about global uh, warming and climate change are all due to a few extremists. I read one right-wing publication recently where one guy criticizing this uh, uh, thesis of global warming used the word uh, alarmist 10 or 12 times. All these people are alarmists and they're just uh, people who are trying to get government grants and enhance their careers in that way. So if uh, uh, global warming and it, environmental regulation apparently would uh, decrease uh, profits and money-making opportunities, uh, then uh, we must uh, come out against them, against them and make claims about the real, true motivation of those who are saying uh, these things. I'll stop there. Thank you, Ron. Uh, David, are you serious or are you an alarmist? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Question and comment for Ron? Yeah. I, will I will sound a toxin. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> word I, I learned from reading Tale of Two Cities. In, oh, yeah. I thought you learned it from Bill grade. Buckley. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but it's not toxic, right? But uh, <laughs> you reminded me of another person, another candidate for, for president who was ridiculed, Harold Stassen. Oh, yes. oh yeah. yeah. The governor, apparently, I didn't never knew much about the man except that throughout the 60s and 70s, 
he would regularly throw his hat in the ring, and there would always be a newspaper article about it. Yeah. And um, uh, it only it sort of reminds me that. And the other the other person you were referring to, I think, was John An Anderson in right. 1980, right. who I actually voted for because uh -huh. he seemed to be a better alternative at that point in my life to either Reagan or Carter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these gentlemen, Estassen and Anderson, were mid Midwest Republicans who invoked uh, a much more liberal image of what it means to be a to be a Republican than what we what we have now. Um, somebody at my office was saying the other day, "What what happened to Wisconsin and Min 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 yeah. Minnesota, mm -hmm. where they're now represented by people like Paul Ryan and mm -hmm. and and." And, and Michelle Bachman, people have a kind of warm and fuzzy historical feeling about the, the sort of quasi-socialist um, mentality that came out of that part of our, our country. And, and explicitly it's, socialist in some yeah, cases. Explicitly yeah. socialist. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in fact, in an article uh, early this week on ZNet, there was a, a, a Greek writer they regularly published, uh, published named uh, Nikos Raptis, who actually was talking about the Forty eighters, that is the eighteen forty eighters, that is the the German, the the Europe European and primarily Germans, who basically got kicked out of Europe at that time because they they tried having a re 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 revolution there, and it, it basically failed, and they came um, 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 to this country with their with their so so socialist ideas, and so. Um, I just found it kind of fascinating that people still sort of feel like Wisconsin and Minnesota and places like that ought to be better than people like Paul Ryan and Michelle Bachman. Uh, Bachman. Uh, why, why aren't they? Yeah, we've come a long way from the days of fighting Bob La Follette mm -hmm. and the Midwestern progressive and populist uh, traditions. I believe the yeah. official name of the uh, party in Minnesota is still the Farmer Democrat Labor uh, Party, but mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, we've come a long way, and the question is why. Getting an a, uh, explanation of that would be very interesting indeed. Yeah, I think one of the things that's happened here is that we're seeing the sort of um, uh, second level uh, uh, success of uh, the neoliberal campaign. Um, remember, what we're, we're looking at here is a, literally a generation-long campaign to uh, take American politics back from the uh, degree of liberalism that emerged in the generation after the Second World War. It's been a pretty successful campaign, uh, and it hasn't just been successful at the national level. It's been successful locally, and uh, the examples that you all mentioned seem to me to, uh, to, to show that uh, uh, quite clearly. Um, the, uh, uh, the EPA is an interesting example here because, of course, the EPA was produced by the most liberal American administration since the Second World War. Uh, it was presided over by a president who probably would not be called liberal except by some of the usual torsion of the term, uh, but uh, uh, it was the Nixon administration that produced the Environmental Protection Agency, not because of Nixon's particular views, but because the political pressures and uh, that existed in the United States out of what we call generically the 60s uh, made it necessary. And the EPA is, was, was, was uh, roundly condemned and deeply hated by American industry because it regulated them. Uh, it cleaned up rivers. It 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 did it uh, attacked uh, um, pollution. Uh, and if you're in the business of making cheese in Champagne Urbana, for example, uh, you don't want anybody telling you that you can't pollute the air. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the EPA is doing that, and we we're seeing now the end of a 30-year campaign which the Democrats have been as active in as Republicans uh, in restricting the EPA, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and perhaps in the new legislation getting rid of it. Uh, so we're, we're looking at uh, you know, long-term trends here, I think, and the long-term trends are, 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 are not happy. Um, I do think, though, that they have something to do with your, uh, uh, your evocation of this um, uh, new uh, badge of seriousness. Uh, 
people are worried about deciding who the serious people are precisely because there's a lot of unserious people emerging now for a while, uh, people who don't buy all the pieties of the neoliberal campaign and uh, therefore have to be dealt with, have to, those limits of allowable debate have to be reasserted and really, uh, to simplify it, it's, it's happening on both sides. The Tea Party on one side and a left critique on the other which uh, is in fact more visible in American politics in spite of the careful attempt of the current administration to make sure that it doesn't have an anti-war movement movement to deal with, there still is a left critique there that really hasn't been heard for a while in American politics. The job of the American parties, the two business parties we have, is to keep this stuff under control, you know, to keep it within those limits of debate. Uh, but now here, you know, there are people emerging on the edge of this that are producing problems for both those parties. And so we need a, a, new, uh, a new badge uh, to tell... Um, uh, to tell who the good guys are, and uh, unfortunately, there are people on both sides. From fortunately, from that point of view, there are people on both sides saying we don't need no stinking badges. But in the are you serious vein, and this may not be a, a, a sla this is not a, a slam dunk. Are you serious? It's just raising this question because it appears that we on the, the uh, left, and I'm I'm, I'm uh, referring to some emails that I've gotten this morning from uh, our friend Bob <laughs> Naiman at and just foreign policy, um, apparently there is a, a certain amount of optimism that the Tea Party will be joining the left in cutting the military budget. We've mentioned um, that. I'm not, I'm, not mm -hmm. real, I'm not real sure about how to respond to that. First of all, it's all promises. It's all in the f way in the future. We all know that when we go to war, or, or what, you're, what we call, what we used to call war, what we know, now call anything but war to, Allow pr allow pr presidents to kind of do it um, whenever they feel like it. Um, that the Congress will the, the the money will be there. The Congress will come up with the money to support our troops. So once again, um, is it is it serious? Is is with the Tea Party? Not you know I'm not talking about the kind of libertarian Ron Paul people that we know oppose these wars on principle. I'm talking about the Tea Party. This, uh, you, you, this is an excellent point. Uh, Barney Frank, who's represented from Massachusetts, and uh, when uh, I was a young undergraduate, he was a graduate student who was talking to those few people who were interested in politics in those days and regularly dined at our house in that regard. Barney has played a, uh, uh, an equivocal role uh, as a Massachusetts liberal ever since he got into the uh, into the Congress. But he said this week, uh, and I'm quoting the Boston Globe here via the uh, comment from Bob Naiman that um, uh, David referred to, the Tea Party, quote, the Tea Party people are anti-military spending to a greater extent than establishment Republicans and have a healthy dose of isolationism thanks to American intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan. On this issue, they are a positive force. Now, this from a man who was taken to be on the liberal fringe of the, uh, uh, of the Congress. Um, uh, we've mentioned this before, and we've mentioned, of course, that there are other strains within uh, the, the Republican Party, uh, such as the paleoconservatives, who uh, take similar views. So the fact that things like that are emerging are worthwhile, and it makes me regret that I did not do what I planned to do in the calendar part of the, of the program, mention that today is the anniversary uh, in the year 1974 of the U.S. Congress uh, placing a $1 billion limit on military aid to South Vietnam. That is, uh, now that was a long time coming, obviously. The uh, war had been on for many years before anything that looked like an anti-war movement got going in the United States in the 1960s. But by 1974, uh, for year, for several years, uh, almost 80 percent of the American public thought that the war in Vietnam was not just a mistake, but it was a crime. Uh, that we were really all, we were doing wrong things, very wrong things there. And finally, finally, Congress got the message and put a limit on what uh, uh, what could be spent uh, in in that war. Okay. So something may, like that may happen again. I mean, this may be a significant anniversary, uh, and I think uh, Representative Frank's comments yeah, may be a good thing. So the Tea Party is serious. So you, you th I mean, I'm just <laughs> affirming. I mean, I, I can go either way with this, but <laughs> I don't trust. 
it isn't, you know, it isn't that I don't necessarily think that, that some of the Tea Partiers would be willing to cut back on the military budget. The question is, how meaningful might those cuts be? What's the strategy? Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, the, 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 strategy, this, the, 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 the strategy is to, you know, the goal is to stop these wars. Right. Not just to cut back on the cost of exactly them while they're right. happening. So, and I don't trust the Tea Party to actually oppose wars. I, I couldn't agree more, David. And I, I think what that means is, yeah. is what we've been saying all along, that the uh, legislative uh, route to ending these wars is to defund them. Uh, no more money shall be spent for uh, mil offensive military operations in the following region and so forth. Um, there have been bills like that introduced all along, uh, and when we have a serious anti-war movement in this country, uh, that will be what we'll be, press we'll be pressing for. Now, it should be obvious that we need a good deal more than a legislative strategy here. Uh, it has to be uh, a popular strategy. Uh, Tahrir Square in Cairo is perhaps a better example mm -hmm. than uh, um, uh, a legislative va battle in the, uh, in the Congress on how to do this. This comes up again and again. Uh, how do we stop the war in Afghanistan in particular? Right. And uh, one view being, of course, that you simply um, stop it, stop fighting, stop killing people. But that's immediately denounced as irresponsible and unserious. And, uh, uh, the way to stop it is to stop it. That's right. But, but uh, uh, that will quickly uh, be denounced as something that uh, uh, makes you unserious. Absolutely, and that's what the serious category is there to do. Yeah. Uh, the late Herb Cain, the uh, San Francisco columnist, you know, uh, in the uh, uh, 40 years ago, uh, when the question finally arose in the American press, how do we get out of Vietnam, uh, had a two-word answer, yeah. ships, planes. Right, right. <laughs> that's how you get out of Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, you are watching News from Neptune for the 5th of August, uh, 2011, uh, and uh, David Green is up. What's uh, you? I know you got something I know provocative, David. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I'm, this is breaking our rules for, for me to do this, but I'm going to read a letter. It's only it's the limit. It's the 250 word limit that I would impose on myself, even if it wasn't imposed by our local newspaper. Uh -huh. But uh, there was a fellow named David Rubinstein, a sociology professor at, at, at UIC, University of Illinois Chicago, who seemed to upset a lot of people this week with this uh, Sunday commentary section saying that he was, he was overpaid for his cushy job during his 30-year tenure at UIC, what started out as University of Illinois at Chicago Circle. Um, and there's been a couple of responses in the last couple of days, so it's, it's aroused some, um, it's aroused some, um, some criticism. I just wanted to sort of, I, I put it in a little different way than I think was put in these other letters, and so I'm going to put that out there, and you you can respond. Uh, you, you too can uh, have at it. Um, D David Rubenstein reveals that he was overcompensated as a sociology professor at UIC. Whatever the value of his labor, his statement serves as an unintended parable for our time. I may have overstated the case, but still. The field of sociology is rooted in cla classic, classic ana analyses of the relationships among ec economic, economic production, labor relations, social relations, and human, human development. Its origins are traced to Adam Smith, Karl Marx, Max Weber, Thorstein Veblen, and others. Sociology lends itself to philosophical considerations of justice, equality, and equality and to public and, and governmental proposals that emerge from rational deliberation. De 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 Certainly none of this is lost on Rubenstein, and the sociology classroom might best be viewed as a civic laboratory for, for a, a, you know, addressing these issues. Ne never, nevertheless, during the decades in which Rubenstein engaged in such discourse, and I'm referring to sociological discourse, not this article, um, the social context of his classroom and the u university changed change dramatically. Public higher education more explicitly and expensively became the price of the, the, price of the ticket, quote unquote, for students aspiring to have their labor exploited for higher levels of mon monetary reward. A privileged class of, cre of cre cre 
of 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 you know credentialed people feels their feels their rewards are just, and that economically stagnant, less educated masses have gotten what what they what they what they what they what they deserve. Both classes go deeper into debt, while notions of a just society are trivialized or 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 a, you know, abandoned. Sociologists can rationalize these, these de developments with crude in in individualism and capitalist determinism, or help us to see the forest for, for the trees. Rubinstein well knows the implications of this choice, and his short-sighted choice of the former at the taxpayer's expense is far more offensive than the expense itself. And what I'm trying to say <laughs> is that um, the while this man was teaching, the world changed, and he hasn't seemed to notice that change. And that's the irony of what I, I find in this, in this article. Um, comments from? Well, I just found the uh, piece, uh, which I saw first on our right wing site, uh, probably, uh, Weekly Standard or... Yeah, it was a Weekly Standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, just thought this was uh, cantankerous uh, uh, nonsense, trying to... If he's trying to generalize from his own case, which, uh, you know, I might uh, agree that he was uh, overpaid and overprivileged, but uh, to a lot of other uh, academic people, uh, that's utter nonsense. And the replies that have appeared in the local uh, paper seem to make that point, that academics... Uh, on the whole, uh, are uh, hardworking people. They just uh, have jobs that they like, and uh, uh, they defy the American uh, standard that uh, work uh, should be something that you dislike. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't call it work. But uh, uh, yeah, I uh, uh, think that in m many cases uh, they. Uh, enjoy what they're uh, doing, despite all of the stresses and so on. In my own case, the biggest stress was uh, student grade fighters who kept coming in and wanting to chisel higher grades. Uh, somehow that made it a little unpleasant. But uh, otherwise, it was uh, quite enjoyable. And I didn't ever think that I was uh, overpaid or overprivileged in the least, as most academics, I guess, do not. But uh, uh, that's that. This, yeah, it's the, the piece seemed to me to be a, a wonderful example of um, uh, what happens when uh, the corruption of the university and the corruption of an intellectual uh, area of concern, I don't know, sociology can be defined any more than that, I don't know, uh, uh, when that corruption uh, produces a career, uh, produce many careers, uh, and we find the hear from the people whose career uh, was shaped by this very corruption. Uh, it, it, the the uh, bought and paid for nature of the ideological disciplines um, uh, in American universities in the period we're talking about here, this guy's a little older than um, than we are. I think he's retired a number of years ago, apparently. Uh, no, but, I think he's actually only 60. Would he say he retired when he was 64? It okay. sounded like he just retired last year or something. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Well, so, so, yeah. so, anyway. A rough contemporary of mine, then, <laughs> yes, if right. you like. Um, right. uh, you younger guys don't yeah. have this problem, but uh, some yeah. of us did see this happen. Yeah. And uh, it is quite remarkable now for someone to notice that, uh, uh, yeah, people were bought off. That's exactly what happened to the American University, and particularly to the sociological discipline. Uh, to put too uh, to, to, to not, not to be uh, too strong about that. Um, uh, yeah, they were bought. Here's a guy who was bought, and he says he was bought. What he leaves out is who bought him and why they bought him. Uh, there is a story told by our mentor Noam Chomsky about this situation. He said. Um, uh, when he was doing Chomsky's original uh, notoriety came from his uh, 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 redoing a field, the field of linguistics, the way, I, the way Einstein had redone the field of physics. Uh, and Chomsky said that when he uh, uh, was a young man and working on language, he realized he had to learn some mathematics that he didn't know. 
uh, the, the notion of recursion in mathematics turns out to be something ext extremely important to understand the structure of languages, which was what he was writing about. So he goes off and learns his uh, learns some uh, uh, so, some mathematics out of this. He was already. Um, at that time, what was called a senior fellow, uh, sorry, a junior fellow at Harvard, which was a, uh, uh, an appointment for the creme de la creme of the, uh, of the intellectual world, and uh, uh, was the idea of bringing these people into uh, the compliance with the standards of the American university system. They take the best ones and put them in this program. Chomsky hated it, by the way. But he said when he had to go learn his mathematics, he found out that the mathematics people that he talked to, uh, the various uh, mathematicians and math departments across the country where he worked on these matters, always wanted to know whether he got the right answer. He said at the, about the same time he started to write about politics, and people in political departments, including history and sociology, wanted to know where he had gotten his history degree. And that was, some, that, was, that was revelatory. That was clear what was happening. Uh, what history degrees uh, were doing in those years, in that generation after uh, the uh, Second World War, was um, uh, making sure that only serious people, in the sense Ron was talking about, uh, would end up in these jobs. And the breakdown of the 60s, from the point of view of the university, was that the system stopped working. What we don't really talk about is how the system was put back together and the university was retamed to the purposes of uh, American ideology, American propaganda, uh, and everyone uh, lived happily ever after. Well, especially in the service of the Cold War, it's remarkable the uh, reversal that occurred uh, during and after World War II and uh, all of the sociologists, the journalists, and literary critics who bought into the uh, big uh, anti-communist uh, uh, critique uh, of the time that emerged in the 40s and 50s. And uh, the best example of that is a counterexample, that is the career of C. Wright Mills, uh, who as a sociologist wrote about the power elite, the people who basically who were doing this sort of thing and were constructing the university that way, and the various forms of the uh, of, uh, of corruption that professions uh, in America were subject to in service of the uh, uh, the Cold War ideology. Uh, he was uh, uh, he was uh, a, a sport, a uh, an outlier, and uh, they did their best to make sure that uh, he outlay a long ways. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that's confusing for people to sort of unpack about what what Professor Rubinson was saying, if they care to do that, is that his the point of his article was that in sociology you almost have to be li liberal. You almost have to be a Democrat. He talks about how 94% 94, 94 of sociology professors voted for Kerry against Bush and this kind of thing. So he sort of excludes, and I understand, you know, where I know where I'm coming from is a different place. I know where you're coming from is a different place. But for those who, and, and he, he purports to, to, to sort of stand apart from that and be able to look at this field and say that this is, Th this is a kind of herd, and he would be right to say so by and large. I mean, there aren't very many C. Wright Mills's left, but, or, or of his not, of his followers. Yeah, and but still, the question the question becomes, as yeah. William <laughs> Buckley used to say, um, you know, how do we, you know, where where has Rubinstein gone wrong in thinking that he's any different from any of these other people that he's he's, you know, that. Who, who's, who he, he feels he's blowing, blowing, blowing the whistle on. You he, know? He's an honest ideologue. It was, it was Lincoln's Secretary of War who coined a central maxim of American politics. An honest politician, he said, is one who stays bought. Mm -hmm. Now, that's also true for honest intellectuals. This guy was an honest intellectual. He was bought and paid for. Mm -hmm. And we have, at, in this sort of swan song, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a testimony to his faith. His seriousness has not left him. Uh, he's, uh, he, he's, he's fought the good fight. <laughs> so, you know, just to evoke the opening of my, of my letter, um, do you think that the field of, so, the, you know, the discipline of so, so, sociology has uh, any of these I, kind of ide idealistic Virtues that I try to I try to ascribe to it. I mean, I mean, I would I would think that if we understand it in terms of this line of thinking from 
Adam Smith, Marx, Veblen, C. Wright Mills, that we can, we can rescue a, not only a, 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 a way of, of, doing, of doing something that might be called a science, but a way of thinking about the world in a way that's, yeah. that's, um, that's um, ar ar arguable and not to mention mor moral. Well, yeah, several streams of thought come together in uh, sociology. One is the tradition uh, that you mentioned, which looks at social structures and institutions and so on. Another one is purely statistical, uh, coming from the demographers of the 19th century who studied uh, you know, how many, uh, there are poor people that were in London and uh, all that kind of thing. And uh, there have been attempts to uh, synthesize these and so on. There's still a third uh, stream, perhaps, of uh, uh, interpretive uh, sociology, uh, uh, looking at uh, what things mean to people and uh, um, 